The internet industry at a crossroads. The U.S. introduces new rules guaranteeing consumers the right to view what they want on the internet, while at the same time giving wireless providers more control. How will this affect users? Are consumers protected? And what does government action mean for the future of internet freedom, not just in the U.S., but worldwide? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Foli Batibo. Regulators in the United States have approved controversial new rules meant to keep the Internet free and accessible to all. But critics fear that allowing wireless service providers to also charge customers higher fees may put some at a disadvantage because it would make it harder for poor Americans to go online. Ross and Jordan has the details. Uh, the eyes have it. I apologize for that. So in a 3-2 vote along party lines, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission has passed rules meant to keep the Internet open and accessible to all Americans. We don't expect to see significant changes. What we are trying to head off are changes uh, that would uh, close the Internet, uh, stifle the incredible innovation and investment that we've seen. But the commission's ruling has angered both Republicans, who call it government interference, and Democrats, who say it doesn't go far enough to protect consumers. In brief, people who access the Internet through a wired connection are not supposed to see any change in how much text or video they can download, how fast they can download the material, or how much they pay for it. Not so if they use their smartphones or other wireless devices to go online. Internet service providers would be allowed to charge customers higher fees for faster downloads and for accessing large amounts of information. Consumer advocates say that's unfair because they claim it prices out the poor who rely mainly on wireless services to go online. They're also worried that Internet service providers will prioritize traffic in their own financial favor at the expense of their competitors. Well, if I had wanted to order a pizza, and my calls only got through to Domino's or got through to Domino's because Domino's paid a higher fee and I couldn't call my local pizza joint because they didn't, they didn't have the money to pay a higher fee. We, that would just be unacceptable. Meantime, conservatives call the decision, more than a year in the making, another example of the Obama administration's efforts to nationalize parts of the economy. As Americans become more aware of what's happening here, I suspect many will be alarmed, as I am, at the government's intrusion. They'll wonder, as many already do, if this is a Trojan horse for further meddling by the government. But in a statement, U.S. President Barack Obama praised the vote as good for the struggling U.S. economy. Quote, this decision is an important component of our overall strategy to advance American innovation, economic growth, and job creation. But the commission may find it difficult to put its rules into action. A federal judge ruled earlier this year that the FCC didn't have the authority to regulate the Internet. Republicans in Congress already are threatening to hold hearings and to withhold agency funding in protest. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, joining us to discuss this issue are our guests in Washington, D.C., James Lewis. He's the director of the Technology and Public Policy Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In London, Martin Geddes, he's a telecommunications consultant. And in New Delhi, India, Pavan Dugal, he's a cyber law expert and attorney in the Indian Supreme Court. Welcome, gentlemen, to the program. Thank you all for being here. Let me start with you in uh, D.C., James Lewis. What do you make of these new rules set by the FCC? Will they, in your opinion, uh, help preserve the free and open nature of the Internet, as the Obama administration claims? I don't think they'll make much difference one way or the other. There's been a concern over net neutrality since its administration came in. But a lot of it is just made up. Uh, we don't know how the Internet's going to change. Uh, some of the telecom companies are having trouble keeping up with demand. Um, the new rules are kind of neutral. Uh, we'll have to see how they play out. I, I don't think this is really a, a big development. It's excited everyone, yes, and mm. so there'll be a lot of noise. But the actual effect, probably minimal. All right, Pavan Dugal in New Delhi, what are your thoughts? Do you think that these new rules go far enough to uh, make the Internet free and open to all? And most importantly, do they go far enough to, to protect consumers? I think uh, it's too early to say how they will pan up, but clearly uh, you are seeing different schools of thought. 
Of course, there's one school of thought that's arguably uh, vehemently in favor of net neutrality, while others believe that that itself could be handled for exploitation. Well, it is still early days of how these rules will be implemented, as James said. But the reality is, uh, internet is far, far bigger than what these rules are currently envisaging. Mm. And more importantly, uh, people will have to realize that internet is not US-centric. Uh, as mobile and as the e-commerce uh, uh, markets across the world are panning on to India and uh, China and Asia, clearly governments in this part of the world will have to be equally involved in this debate. It's no longer a US-centric exercise alone. Well, it's interesting that you point out that the internet is not US-centric, and we'll touch on that issue in, in uh, just a little while. Uh, I want to ask you, Martin Geddes, in London, this decision uh, by the FCC was prompted by concerns that uh, uh, the large phone and cable firms were, were getting basically too powerful as internet gatekeepers. But now, under these new rules, from what I understand, uh, that wireless providers will get more power. They, they, they'll set the rules. They'll decide uh, who, what content we see, what applications applications uh, we can use. Isn't there a double standard in this? Is there a double standard? No, I don't think there is. Um, I think this act feels very much, or this, uh, these rules very much feel like a, a full employment uh, law for lawyers, um, all of whom have a field day arguing over the meaning of the word reasonable. Um, the differences between wireline and wireless networks really aren't that substantial in terms of the uh, underlying um, problems we're seeing here. Uh, there is a reasonable uh, court case, though, to be made for treating wireless networks differently because they actually work differently from wireline networks. But most people, uh, the FCC's argument is that broadband is the way that most people uh, access the Internet and that, therefore, uh, we shouldn't worry uh, about the fact that uh, wireless access might have more control. Do you agree with that? Uh, there's a need for reasonable network management for wireless operators, but they're very unlikely to abuse this because at the end of the day, if they wanted to, for example, block a competing video or voice service from Google, then Google has enormous power in return and could block search service to those customers. So in practice, these regulations are fighting a bogeyman that really isn't there. All right. Uh, James Lewis in Washington, Washington, how do you think uh, these new regulations are, are going to affect the way Americans use the internet, if at all? Well, I think that one of the things we're seeing is the demand for the wireless services has increased far beyond anyone's expectations. I was talking to one of the big phone companies, their CTO, uh, a couple weeks ago, and he said the thing that surprised them was streaming radio. So, you know, everyone's gotten an iPad or an iPod or an iPhone, and they connect through their wireless network to radio stations, and that's eating up the bandwidth. These companies can't keep up with demand. So if the rule does what they hope it will do, which is keep the service providers on the wired side from prioritizing in their economic interest, and at the same time, let the wireless guys have the... Mm. But as we've all said, to be seen. To be seen. And you think that we, in the United States anyway, that we're moving more towards the wireless service and the broadband system? That's true, across, that's true across the world. The way mm. people will connect to the Internet will be with mobile wireless devices. But will that, will, will that put some people at a disadvantage? Google. Wouldn't that put that some people at a, at a disadvantage? As some of the critics of these new regulations have been saying, that poorer Americans will, will be disadvantaged if people are moving more towards a wireless. No, I don't think so. And if you look at it, the, the, the thing to watch here is, uh, is, is cell phones, is uh, mobile devices. And everyone in the world has them. In some countries, like the US or in Europe, people have one or two of these things. So mm -hmm. I think the, the technology is actually making it easier to connect. All right, Pavan Dugal in, in New Delhi. Uh, most consumers in the United States uh, haven't had a problem viewing uh, whatever they want online until recently, perhaps with the WikiLeaks controversy. Uh, in your opinion, were these new rules necessary or is it just another example of government interference as the Republicans are claiming? See, one thing is very clear. Internet was born out of inherent uh, values of, of freedom and transparency and hence any kind of an effort by any government uh, which has an attempt at regulation is always seen as a great no-no, as a great uh, predatory effort. But the fact remains, today's world, when we are now seeing so much of threats onto the networks and with so much of uh, cyber criminal and cyber terrorist activities in this part of the world, 
clearly there's a need for governmental intervention. Now, I'm not very sure how far this will impact consumers within US and more importantly, whether it will at all impact computers, uh, consumers within other countries. To take the example of India, India has got a huge booming uh, population of uh, mobile users and who are connecting onto the internet. I'm not particularly sure of how this will pan up in terms of its, its impact mm. upon Indian users, but Indian service providers will be very clear. They would want to give as much information as they can, as many services on mobile networks as they can because here is the market. And as far as these rules are concerned, these rules may just apply to a US-centric environment, but would definitely not apply in environments like India and China. All right, Martin Geddes in London, do you agree with that? Uh, do you agree that there is a need for government interference to regulate the internet? Uh, I think it's misframing the problem. I think that there are definitely real problems out there that exist, for example, with uh, uh, illegal content. Um, uh, and there are existing mechanisms. So, for example, in the UK, we have the Internet Watch Foundation that helps to deal with that. And that's born through cooperative activity amongst telcos and internet service providers. Is there a new class of problems that requires government intervention? Probably not at the moment, no. It's, um, uh, there may be a, a temporary backlash against the, the WikiLeaks controversy, right. but I think trying to regulate the internet as a, as a distribution mechanism the same way as, say, radio TV work is just do doomed to fail. All right, well, this latest bill in the United States comes as uh, the United Nations also announced it had set up a working group to regulate the Internet. The committee comprised of representatives from governments around the world will come up with ways to monitor how we use the Internet. Critics say, though, this could infringe on personal freedoms and such regulations may be used to quash freedom of speech. But others are dismissing the idea as impossible to implement. Now, one of the main reasons uh, far too much money is made through the internet. For example, in 2009, Americans spent more than $150 billion buying goods through the internet. And it's not only Americans that spend their money via the internet. Research shows that online purchases in Western Europe amounted to almost $100 billion last year. And with almost half of America's population using the internet to buy things and with millions of people around the world logging on every day, it's projected that more and more money will be spent online. James Lewis in Washington, D.C., do you think it's possible to regulate a beast like the internet? Oh, sure, it's possible. Uh, you know, it's based on uh, physical reality. It's based on machines that are located somewhere every part of the internet is actually under some sovereign nation's control and that means that if they think about it if they develop the right tools and those tools are being developed they'll be able to control it so i think the extension of government control into the internet is inevitable and the question is how do we make sure that extension doesn't result in some very bad political and economic outcomes. Martin Geddes, you don't seem to agree with that idea. You think the internet is unpoliceable. I wouldn't say it's unpoliceable, but um, if you try to completely repress uh, people getting hold of content they actually want to get hold of, we saw, for example, even before the internet, say in Soviet Union with the Samizdat movement, you can't stop information being uh, moved around. However, as you, uh, our other correspondent said, is that you, you can actually regulate the specific services or specific um, devices that exist. So that it's possible to, to create regulations but it's not possible to create regulations that stop people doing what they actually want to do. All right. Uh, Pavan Dugal, the U.S. is certainly the country with the most sophisticated regulations for, for the Internet. How widely applicable, in your opinion, are, are the new rules uh, to other nations? And, you know, can countries consider uh, regulating the Internet that are considering regulating the Internet, I should say, learn from these new rules? Or do you think that each country uh, must have its own rule. You see, the very fact that internet made geography history grace, gave rise to a huge amount of jurisdictional issues. Now, it's correct that every part of internet is located in some country or the other, but the fact is that there's no one country which can hold and claim sovereign jurisdiction over the internet at large. Mm -hmm. Therefore, countries have started their own 
specified methodologies of how to control the internet and that's happening through their own respective national legislations and that's where the problem arises the national legislations are only applicable to your territorial boundaries and not beyond and that's why countries across the world are finding that cyber criminals and cyber terrorists are misusing this so-called anonymity on the internet and the ability to do any crime anywhere uh, to go ahead and escape from the shackles of law and i think here it's there's a need for coming up with a far more important uh, international body which can help uh, far more regulation and cooperation but do you amongst think, nations per se. But you talk about coming with a, a body, but do you think that there can be one universal model for uh, internet content regulation? I don't think so, because at the end of the day, though internet has world, uh, joined the world together as one civilization, the fact remains countries are in their own respective sociological modes. Values are different, societies are different, and therefore to have one common code for conduct across the internet for the entire world is going to be an impossibility. I think the internet is a diverse heterosphere and it will keep on incorporating various kinds of different customized elements coming from different parts of the world to make it a more heterogeneous lot. Uh, James Lewis, do you agree with that? Do you think that there could be a body that could regulate the internet and if so, what kind of organization could step up and offer standards for, for offering protection online? Well, you're seeing a couple trends uh, going on at the same time, and a lot of times it's the same countries behind them. Uh, you do see some interest in trying to fragment the Internet, to break it from being a global network into different national or regional networks, and that would give people a greater degree of control. It may not be possible. Remember, you don't need a perfect solution. You only need to get maybe 80, 90 percent of the people mm -hmm. finding it too hard to connect to information from outside. So that's one trend. You've got the governance trend, and this is the, should the ITU or the UN take over and somehow run the Internet? The fear on the U.S. side is that if you do that, you're going to see a lot of places try and inject, in other words, limiting access to information they didn't want their citizens to have. And I think that's a real goal for a number of countries. So you have an effort to manage the political effects of the internet and countries are approaching this in different but ways. But would it but work in practice in your opinion? I mean we, we see uh, for instance oh. bodies such as the ICC being set up, the uh, Interpol being set up for countries mm -hmm. to work together. W would, would a body uh, like this to regulate the internet, one common body, would it work in practice? Here's the first problem, which is there's a few countries that really like cybercrime. It makes them a lot of money. It gives them an intelligence advantage. And so even if you set up a body with those two countries in particular, China and Russia, would they cooperate? Mm. And if they're not going to cooperate, you can set up any body you want, and it's not going to work. If we can come to common understandings on what responsible behavior is, then it will be like any other law enforcement problem, or it will be like air travel, or it will be any of these international institutions, finance, trade, where we do have a body, but its, it's rules and its authorities are limited, and right. that's a possibility. And this is the case for international institutions such as the International Criminal Court, which you know the U.S. is not a signatory to, so it would be very interesting to see if such a body uh, could even be set up in the first place. Uh, let me go to you, Martin Geddes, uh, in uh, London. Uh, you mentioned uh, England before and uh, the measures they have there. Uh, tell us about the other approaches that have been adopted by, by countries that have attempted to regulate the Internet. Okay, so what you've heard today with these network neutrality rules is America trying to retrofit a more fair and equitable set of rules on usage of the network. Um, and that's because in America they have a different uh, structure from in many other countries. So, for example, here in the UK, uh, we have uh, BT as being the main provider of um, fixed networks and was broken into two, and one part providing the, the network, the other one providing services. And we don't have some of these problems with network neutrality. Um, and so, as we heard from the other um, people talking, is that, uh, that the, these different countries have very different political and economic and technical um, traditions in the networking sphere and need different responses as well. Oh, you, you talk about different countries have different rules, but there are some commercial, uh, commercial rules out there uh, as far as regulating the Internet. And I want to know, uh, what I want to know is, you know, who gives access, for instance, uh, to private companies uh, on the right to decide uh, what, uh, you know, some, some of the stuff that we should see online, you know, on the right to decide that some unapproved speech will, for instance, encourage uh, and some okay. will be suppressed. Who gives them that right? Um, 
Well, there is obviously a freedom of speech issue here, mm. but actually, if you think about um, having a great uh, diversity of business models, we've actually seen the exact opposite from the American uh, proposal uh, very recently from uh, an operator in Russia. And what they would like to offer is free access to their subscribers. However, certain banks and entertainment companies might have to pay to get their services distributed. Well, is that increasing or decreasing freedom of speech? It's certainly not uh, a neutral network. Mm. James Lewis in, in Washington, do you think free speech can be protected on a private sphere like the Internet? You know, the BBC did a poll uh, a few months ago, a global poll, pretty good, that asked people around the world, uh, do you think that free access to information is a fundamental human right? And about 80 percent of the world said yes. They thought it was a fundamental human right. And the problem we have is that there are many, many governments that don't want to accept that. So in the U.S. right now, I don't have any trouble accessing any information I want. But in other countries, you either can't access it or you have to go through innumerable hoops and hurdles. And that's the problem we have is that there's a global demand for free access and there's governments that want to stand in the way. How do you come up with norms that adjust that? It's not possible, as you've heard from some of the other speakers. We'll have to find regulation that maybe will work against crime and that will ensure equal economic opportunity, but that won't get into the subject of regulating content. There's just no way we'll get agreement on that. All right, Pavan Dugal in, in New Delhi. So if I understand it correctly, ultimately then uh, each country's regulation of the Internet uh, is driven not by technology or law, but rather by by the country's culture and in the broadest sense by its society. And in that case, then it would be impossible to regulate something like free speech online. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. In fact, uh, national sovereign governments are building up boundaries within the boundaryless medium of cyberspace. And that's the reason why sovereign governments, each of them have their own vested interests or uh, things to achieve. And that's the reason you, if you're going to look at a universal right of access, while the users are all going to vote for it, uh, the governments may or may not necessarily look in that particular direction. And with increased kind of criminal activities and attacks on sovereignties of nations, using computer systems and networks, clearly governments are in no mood to give the absolute unbridled right of access to people. Uh, governments across the world, and more so in this part of Asia Pacific, are beginning to feel that it's their inherent sovereign right to monitor, to block, to intercept, given the fact that there are various challenges to uh, the autonomy, to the sovereignty of different nations. So I think at the end of the day, it's always going to be a mixed bag. This, the world is never going to be completely white or completely black. There will be all areas of grey ahead. All right, James Lewis, you have the last word. We are uh, certainly, it seems, at a crossroads here as far as the future of the Internet is concerned. Uh, so where do you think we're headed? You know, I think that some of the earlier comments got it exactly right. It's no longer American-centric. The issue is what will be the values that shape the future of the Internet? Will it be free speech and equal economic opportunity? Or will it be the kind of more controlled political and business situations we see in some other countries, like China, for example? And this is a crucial moment. We can either go in a way that will increase freedom or we can go in a way that will increase control. And right now it's too hard to predict. We all hope it will go in the way of freedom, but I wouldn't take any bets. All right. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in Washington, D.C. James Lewis in London, Martin Geddes, and in New Delhi, Bhavan Dugan. Thank you all. And thank you as well for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. As always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching.